And there are some ditches that are required to be buffers in Randleman. So I encourage you, if you work in the Randleman watershed, to um, open that up and read it because some ditches are, right, are buffered. It does not apply to ephemeral streams. Um, and a lot of people will say, what's the difference between the ephemeral stream and a ditch? Um, we consider the ditches as man-made features. Ephemeral streams are natural features that are just drainages not connected to the groundwater. Um, it does not apply to ponds that aren't connected to streams. So there are a lot of upland ponds in North Carolina dug for prior um, agriculture or just um, aesthetics. It wouldn't apply if it's not connected to a stream. The buffer rules do not apply to wetlands. You may have wetlands within a buffer, but we do not, these rules do not say you have to buffer wetlands. And um, they do not apply to ponds constructed and used for agricultural purposes, and that's defined now in the rules. Once you figured out if the stream has a buffer, how big is the buffer? Uh, in five of the buffer rules um, listed here, there is a 50 foot buffer on both sides of streams, lakes, ponds, or estuaries. That starts at the top of bank or the normal water level if you're talking about an open water body. The first um, 30 feet is considered zone one and that is undisturbed vegetation, forest vegetation. So the trees are supposed to remain there except for certain uses, which I'll talk about. Zone two is the outer 20 feet, and that can be managed vegetation. So that could be um, woody vegetation, trees and shrubs, natural forest. It also could be just managed as grass or pasture or something like that. Um, but in total, 50 feet is protected. So um, anything that occurs in that 50 feet has to be something allowed by the buffer rules. Now in Goose Creek, that's the one oddity. Um, because that is so small and uh, federally endangered species is so dependent on the water quality there, those buffers are um, either 100 or 200 feet wide. It is always undisturbed forest vegetation. And the difference of um, the 100 and the 200 feet is whether you're inside or outside of the 100 year floodplain. So that one's very different in how you apply the width of the buffer. So we get a lot of questions about how do you measure the distance, um, the buffer distance? Um, do you measure horizontally when you're looking at a plan set or do you go out and topographically measure it with the lay of the land? The answer to that is you measure it um, horizontally as if you were a bird's eye view up above um, or you're looking at a plans that you're drawing out um, on a piece of paper. We get a lot of questions about where the top of bank is. Um, in the rules, it says the uh, either the top of the stream bank or the ordinary um, uh, uh, normal high water level of open waters, ponds and lakes. For streams, the top of bank can get kind of confusing, um, especially in the Piedmont where you have a lot of inside streams. So they're down deep in a gully. The stream is 15 feet down. Um, what we do there is apply the top of bank as sort of the normal water level where you don't see vegetation growing. So that's this, the picture on the bottom here. This is a four foot wide stream channel in a 15 foot wide gully. And that gully probably formed 50 years ago and it just can't recover. We don't apply the buffer at that top of bank where it starts to be horizontal. That's where a surveyor would normally call a top of bank and that's what gets confusing. Um, and that can make a big difference for some people. You can see that's, you know, 11 foot difference. Um, so depending on where the buffer starts could affect a property significantly. Um, we get a lot of people who are, say, um, I thought the buffer started at the edge of coastal wetlands and they would be right um, previously. So when the Noose and Tar Pam rules were first written, there was a requirement that you took the open water body, then you attached any coastal wetlands, then you started the buffer. But a few years back, the General Assembly decided that that was just too difficult to work with um, and limiting a lot of people's use of their property. So now it is the normal water level. Um, and, and that is in the 20 coastal counties that, you, that have coastal wetlands defined in regulations. Um, 
that now begins at the most landward limit of the normal high water level. And they use field indicators to identify where that water line is because it fluctuates with the tide. Um, so if you're working with someone who's been around a while and knows the buffer rules from when they were first passed, just make sure that everybody's on the same page that that coastal wetlands requirement changed uh, maybe about five or six years ago. And another question we get is where do you start measuring the buffer on the edge of a lake or a pond, and especially what about a beaver impoundment? So the edge of the lake of the pond is the normal water level. That's often taken from taking an elevation of the dam structure, the outlet structure. What is the normal outlet? Um, not the fluctuation of the highest level it could be. Uh, also not the lowest level it could be in drought situations. So it's the, the normal um, outlet riser structure. In a beaver impoundment, we do the same thing. We take the elevation of the beaver dam, uh, which yes, can change over time, but we have to just apply it at the day that we're there. So what can you do in a buffer? Um, as I mentioned, zone one is um, specifically in the rules as a vegetated area to be undisturbed, except for items that are specifically listed out in the rules. Zone two actually says the same thing. It's supposed to be an undisturbed vegetated area, except for specific items outlined in the rules. But one of those items is that you can grade um, zone two, provided you are not compromising the vegetation in zone one, and you're not allowing stormwater um, to infiltrate zone one in a conveyed or a um, concentrated manner. So we get a lot of questions about what about pruning. Um, pruning is actually now defined in five of the six rules. Jordan doesn't have a definition, but we use the same definition as the other rules. And that's the removal of dead tree and shrub branches um, or live branches um, with a certain diameter tree or shrub. So it's spelled out differently for deciduous and coniferous trees and shrubs. I encourage you, if that question comes up, to go to the rules and specifically read the definition. It is very specific, um, and a lot of people take an aggressive approach to pruning that would not be allowed the way the rules are written. There is an allowance for existing and ongoing uses in the rules. Um, so this means if the activity was happening when the, when the rules were passed and it's continued to, to be maintained in that manner, then it's, um, you know, the old term would be grandfathered. It's allowed as an existing use. Now, each of the buffer rules have a different um, start date. So that existing use would be um, dependent on when the buffer rules were passed. Uh, and you'll see an asterisk here for Randleman and Jordan Lake. Because those rules were delegated to the local governments, it took each local government a different amount of time to draft up their ordinance and put them in place. So it would be the time, the date, when the ordinance went into place. And that was when the new rules would have been applicable to properties. Uh, keep in mind that only the portion of the buffer that contains the footprint of that use is exempt. So it doesn't mean the whole property is exempt. If someone had a mowed lawn um, and then they, they um, wanted to expand that, it, they, they can't do that um, just because it's on their property where they had some mowed lawn. It would only be the footprint that they were mowing at the time the buffer rules went into effect. And then um, all of the buffer rules have a table of uses. If you've used this before, you can um, try and pull out your hair sometimes trying to figure out how to navigate the table of uses. Um, they look a little different. We, um, we went through a rule revisions last year and I'll talk about some of that. And, and one thing we did was change how these tables um, were listed. So um, Jordan has some old language. The other five rules have some newer language. Um, they mean the same thing. The intent is if your activity is listed in the table of uses, you may be able to proceed. You may not need anything from the buffer implementing authority, the local government or the state, um, but some activities are only allowable upon approval. So um, in some cases, you may be doing one of the activities in the table of uses, but it requires you to get approval first. And that approval process, um, Paul will speak to that a little bit. It, it just makes sure that the minimum 
um, impacts are occurring to the buffer. So back in um, last summer, we um, went, went through a multi-year process that finally came to an end in the summer of 2020. And that did um, revise five of the six buffer rules, all but Jordan. So um, the problem that happened is we started that process uh, a few years back and everybody got involved and then it sort of um, sat on a shelf for a little while and it just finalized last year. So it seems like it came out of nowhere to some people, but we had been working on it. It was just how long the procedure took to get through the process. And there was a long lag in that, the end of it. So people forgot that we were working on these. Um, our main goals when we took that, uh, undertook that, um, process was to revise a lot of outdated requirements. Those new buffer rules were from the 90s, same with the Randleman rules. Um, and there were a lot of things we learned since then that we wanted to incorporate. There were a lot of um, stormwater um, improvements that we wanted to incorporate. So we did that. We took all of our rules and we sort of modified all the outdated stuff. What we had learned went into the new version of the rules. Um, we wanted to provide consistency between as many of the rules as we could, including some of our other regulations, such as stormwater or watershed protection rules, some of the federal regulations. We wanted to do as much as we could to provide the regulated community with consistency. We improved a lot of language, like I said, addressed some of the inconsistencies. There had been a lot of legislation over the years telling us how to interpret our rules or how to do them differently. So we incorporated all that into these new revisions. Um, and we tried to improve the, the process, the regulatory burden and the flexibility to the community. What didn't change, um, as I mentioned, the Jordan Lake buffer rules did not go through this process. Um, so they didn't change. They were the newest of our rules. So um, they had a lot of the improvements already in them. They just don't now look the same as the rest of them. Um, but also what didn't change is the each buffer rules scope, purpose, and applicability. So everything I just talked about, how you measure the buffers, where it applies in the specific buffer rules, what their purpose was, none of that changed. We really just changed more of the procedural stuff. Um, we kept the exist exemptions and existing uses. We kept the zone one and zone two, except for Goose Creek, which doesn't have zones. Um, we kept the table of uses, much to many people's dismay. Uh, we evaluated different ways of getting that information in there and the table of uses just uh, worked the best. And we did not change anything about which local governments were um, delegated, designated, how they go through that process. All of that remained the same. We um, clarified a few issues, but none of it really changed. So if somebody was delegated before, they kept their delegation, even though we had modified these rules. What really changed was the look and the location of these buffer rules. So um, we, in, in part of this process, we had to reorganize where they belonged in the North Carolina Administrative Code. So just an example, the news buffer rules used to be the O2B, O233 rules, um, and now they are in 714. So if you have, go, if you're used to using those citations, you'll have to go look for the new citations. Um, you can go to our website. This table, cross-reference table is available on our website, and it just talks about where it was before and where it is now in case you can't find it. Um, also, some of the rules were broken up into multiple rules. So everything in the news rules is now into four rules. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what we did there is we got a lot of comments from the regulated community and people using these rules that it would be really nice if all the rules were the same. News to TARPAM. Um, in fact, in our breakout session, one of our, our people mentioned that, you know, there's all differences no matter where you go. We looked at that and we looked really carefully. Uh, it turns out that because they all have different purposes and slightly different applicabilities, it'd be really hard to just have one buffer rule. Um, it ended up saying, except for here, except for there, except for here, and it turned out just as confusing. But what we did is identify the parts of those buffer rules that could be the same, and we took them out and put them into one place. So now there's one rule that, that has our definitions. There's one rule 
that talks about how to get authorization certificates, approvals from the implementing authority. And Paul will talk a little bit about that process. And there's one location for forest harvesting requirements. So those were the same across all the buffer rules. And now they're not in the specific buffer rules. They're in their own rules. So if we change a definition, it'll change for everybody at the same time. And hopefully that'll help simplify it. And as I mentioned, we changed the um, table of uses. We changed just the, the categories, what we call them. We found that some of the category language, um, it was confusing to the users out there. So we tried to come up with some better terminology. Um, so everything that was exempt is now called deemed allowable. That's more of a term that the permitting world is used to, to hearing, deemed permitted, deemed approved. Um, and we clarified that allowable meant allowable upon getting a piece of paper from the authority, so upon authorization. Um, and we created a new category that's called allowable upon exception. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So this allowable upon exception, now for those of you who are in Jordan or work in the Jordan, just um, I know it's frustrating that not everything is the same, but in this case, Jordan doesn't have this because they didn't go through this rule revision with the other five. But what that is, is for any activity that's not listed in the table of uses, we just couldn't think of it because it's a once or twice occurrence. Um, things in the table of uses are things that happen all the time, roads and um, forestry activities and people wanting to put in utility lines. But this is for things that we didn't think of. Um, so if it's not in the table of uses, it used to be prohibited automatically, and you had to go through this long variance process, which included going to our Environmental Management Commission, which was a long scheduling process more than anything. So we now have this allowable upon exception, which keeps a lot of the criteria the same, but changes the process so it's simpler. So those people have to show that there are hardships. Um, why do you need to do this activity? Um, there are steps that are outlined. You have to, to meet those requirements. Um, and there is mitigation required, which means you will um, pay into a fund that will support and protect and restore buffers elsewhere. But the process can be approved by the implementing authority. So that means either the Division of Water Resources of, or the local government. What we did was take out the step where it goes to our Environmental Management Commission, and that was what was taking the longest. So we decided that staff could go through this process. The criteria is spelled out pretty clearly in the rule. Um, we differentiated between minor and major exceptions. So how much buffer impact there is, determines whether it's the simpler minor exception or the slightly more complicated major exception. Um, major exceptions will have to go out to public notice. That's the biggest difference. Now, one thing to note, and I, I highlighted that the exceptions are approved by the implementing authority. While the rule says this, um, local governments still have to follow the current ordinances. And those ordinances all probably still say variances are required. So until local governments have a reason or need to update their ordinances, there might be some a period of time where they have to follow a variance process, even though the state rules are a little um, less requirements um, for this exception. And we can work with local governments if that comes up. Luckily, variances aren't all that common, um, especially now we've expanded some of the table of uses to add a few things that we were seeing all the time. So those won't trigger variances. But if it does, we can work with all parties involved to sort of navigate this process. The take home is it's, a, it's the same process or the same requirements, a different process and a little faster and simpler to get through the process. Whether that ends up in approval or not, that's a different story, but the process itself has been simplified. So like I said, we did do some table of uses updates. Um, table of uses used to have pages of footnotes. That was too hard for people to go find those. Um, so we incorporated them into the table itself, made the table look a little longer and a little scarier, but now you only have to go to one place. Um, similar items were combined together. Again, that, that helped. Now, what I will say is the table is alphabetical, 
but it might be alphabetical under, in this example, roads, and you might have a bridge or a driveway or a sidewalk or a greenway, and you're looking for those things. And if you don't know the first word we used, you won't know where to look in the table. So it is a good idea to go through every item and make sure you found the item where your project fits. Um, we made significant changes to allowances for residential properties and structures, and that was based on legislation that had passed over the years. We just incorporated that into the buck rules. So there's a lot more allowed in the table of uses for um, residential properties that had been platted before the buffer rules went into a place. It, um, we expanded some of the allowances for stormwater control measures, um, and we made significant updates and revisions to the utility line and uses in the table of uses. Um, they, they weren't covering all the utility situations, and those are just a dime a dozen, to be honest. So we expanded that so that we could try and cover as much as what we could think of. So just real quick about the, the stormwater changes. Um, most of you are probably, if you've worked with the buffer rules, familiar with the term diffuse flow. That started back in the new rules um, in the 90s. That term's not really used in the stormwater world these days. Um, and stormwater management has developed significantly in 20 years. So we tried to update our stormwater requirements um, in the buffer rules. Now we're just calling it stormwater runoff through the buffer. And we um, changed the terminology of diffuse flow to dispersed flow because that is now a defined term in our stormwater regulations. And we actually cited the stormwater regulations. So over the years, there's been a lot of strain on the regulated community to to work with a buffer or a buffer program that refers to stormwater in one way and a stormwater program that refers to stormwater and, and provides allowances differently. We tried to merge the two as much as possible. So you'll see we reference a lot of the terminology and requirements in the stormwater rules themselves. That way, if they change, the buffer rules will update automatically. Um, we allow conveyances from treatment systems. That was something that wasn't in the buffer rules. Now it's very clear that if, if you're doing treatment, that conveyance um, can, can be in the buffer without added approvals. And we allowed for some situations like minor discharges through the buffer of stormwater when you can show that it's not um, increasing nutrient loads to the water feature, to the to the stream or the estuary. Um, we uh, allowed for situations where it's a small amount of flow and it wouldn't be erosive to not have to do this dispersed flow that you, that you may be able to convey small amounts of flow. We talk about allowing for realignment of conveyances. So it's stuff we had come across over the years that the previous rules language weren't allowing us to be flexible enough. So we tried to incorporate everything we had learned. And we also incorporated a little flexibility in saying, if there's something we haven't thought of, it can be dealt with through the allowable upon exception process so that it didn't automatically become prohibited. So I would say that the stormwater is one of the biggest things we updated and hopefully for the best for everybody out there. And that is my last slide, Grace. I'll turn it back over to you 